you'll be turning in your Bibles, we'll return this week to Hebrews chapter 4. We're only going to look at, um, at two verses this morning of chapter 4, uh, although we could um, plumb the depths of the whole chapter. It carries much uh, in way of importance to us. Certainly, the whole idea of continuing, not falling away, that dire warning that the writer of Hebrews uh, continues to to give us over and over again uh, for us not to harden our hearts against the Lord as the children of Israel did in the wilderness. Uh, They're turning their backs on the goodness and mercy of God and God therefore bringing judgment upon them such that all adults died in the 40 years of the wilderness. The writer making the, the, the point that just like those in the wilderness did not enter the rest that was promised to them in the land of Canaan, so we too will not enter our rest if we harden our hearts against an eternally gracious God. Our eternal rest, of course, is eternity with Christ. And it is the Holy Spirit that certainly applies that principle to us. But I wanted to take at least one Sunday to concentrate on these two very familiar, or should be very familiar, verses uh, that speak to God's Word, His living and active Word. So let's stand together as we do each week, and they did in the days of Ezra. We too stand in honor uh, and humility before God's Word. Hear the Word of the Lord, beginning in Hebrews 4 and in verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this, your holy word. We pray that we would see no man save Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. When we look at the book of Hebrews and read it as, um, as a sermon, which is probably what it was intended uh, to do, we see that the writer is constantly doing a couple of things, at least in these first four chapters. He's showing us the superiority of Christ superior to Moses, superior to the angels. But he's also telling us that we dare not turn our back on this one who is superior. And he has supported his arguments at every turn by quoting Scripture. Um, He has... He has shown us that persevering to the very end of life is so important, that we dare not become faint in our walk, in our growth, in our sanctification before the Lord. And now we see the authority of Scripture as is laid out here. His authority that He claims for these 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 lessons 
are, is based in the authority of God's Word itself. What God has written. It is, after all, binding on our conscience, not because it's an ancient document, but because it is the very living Word of God. Now, he has appealed many times to the Psalms. And we constantly have talked about and seen that these Psalms that were applicable in David's day are still important and applicable to us today. They are relevant because they are the very Word of God. He is living and active. And His Word is living and active as well. It was Thomas Watson, the great, one of the great Puritans, who said, By reading other books, the heart may be warmed, but by reading this book, the heart is transformed. And that's an incredibly important statement. For it is the Word of God that brought you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, from being dead to the things of God to being alive to Him. The fact that you have a new heart, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, is due to the Word of God and the application of that Word by the power of the Holy Spirit to you. It is authoritative. And so I want to look for just a minute this morning as we look at this passage. <clears throat> I want to pull out, uh, there are two questions in the Westminster um, Larger Catechism that speak to this very passage. And so I thought as a way of framing the, the beauty of verse 12 and 13 in Hebrews 4, we might look for just brief moments this morning at question 3 and 4, uh, a catechism that we anybody who's a member of this church has assented to because it is the perfect basis, I think, for what this passage is trying to say. Question 3 in the larger catechism says, what is the Word of God? And the answer is, the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament are the Word of God, the only rule of faith and obedience. We've heard that before. Question four, though, expands that. It says, how does it appear that the Scriptures are the Word of God? In other words, how do we know that the Old and New Testament is the Word of God? And the answer is magnificent. The Scriptures manifest themselves to be the Word of God by their majesty and purity, by the consistent of all the parts and the scope of the whole, which is to give all glory to God by their light and power to convince and convert sinners to comfort and build up believers unto salvation. But the Spirit of God, bearing witness by and with the Scriptures in the heart of man, is alone able to fulfill and persuade it that they are the very words of God. So I want to unpack that just a little bit this morning as we consider what the writer of Hebrews has talked about, this living and active Word of God. Now, the big word, for this, um, that theologians use is the perspicuity of Scripture. The perspicuity of Scripture. And all that means is that Scripture is clear enough and understandable enough by anyone with average intelligence to understand that there is a God... That we are human beings and are sinners, and that we need a Savior. 
Those are kind of the three elements of the gospel, aren't they? Who God is, who we are, and what we need. Question four, I think, helps us to understand the teaching of this passage. And so, let me read it one more time. The Scriptures manifest or make themselves to be the Word of God, or show themselves is a better word there, to be the Word of God by their majesty and purity, by the consent of all the parts and the scope of the whole, which is to give glory to God by their light and power to convince and convert sinners, to comfort and build up believers unto salvation. But it is the Spirit of God bearing witness by and with the Scriptures, and the heart of man is alone able to fully persuade it that it is the Word of God. Scriptures prove themselves to be God's Word by their majesty and purity. Have you ever thought about that? That as you read the Bible, it is a book like any other story book, and yet it is not like any other story book. There is a grandeur to it. The, the author who wrote each of the books is not writing of his own accord, but he is writing the majestic Word of God as God has breathed it out. There's a grandeur and a greatness to His Word. If we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 6, we would read these, uh, these words. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, it is written, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love Him. But God has revealed it to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Psalm 119. Open my eyes that I might see the wonderful things of your law. Verse 129 of that great psalm. Your statutes are wonderful. There is a majesty, a, 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 an awe that surrounds God's Word. And it is our privilege to be able to read it. And yet we fail so miserably oftentimes in that. We read anything and everything more than God's Word. We spend more time on Facebook than in God's Word. We spend more time watching TV than in God's Word. But it is majestic. But it is not only majestic. The Westminster divines tell us that it is also pure there's a purity of scripture testifying that it is god's word psalm 12 verse 6 the words of the lord are flawless flawless well not only is scripture majestic and pure the scriptures prove themselves this question says by the consent of the parts and the scope of the whole. What does that mean? Well, it means that even though the Bible is made up of 66 books, written by at least 40 authors, written over 1,500 years, that what we have here tells one story. One theme, and that is God's plan of redemption in Jesus Christ. So if you start in Genesis in the garden there, or you end up in Revelation in the garden there, it is all about Christ. We've seen that. 
both in men's Bible study and in women's Bible study, that all the Old Testament points to the coming Messiah, that the New Testament expands and gives us and testifies to His work. Think of Acts 10, 43. All the prophets testify about Him, that everyone who believes in Him receives forgiveness of sin through His name. Think about the great sermon on the road to Emmaus, where Jesus opens up His perfect knowledge of Scripture to those two disciples and shows how the Christ was to be crucified there in Jerusalem. What did the two say after Christ departed from them? Remember, he broke bread, stayed at their house, broke bread, and then disappeared. And they got up and looked at each other as they got ready to leave to go back to Jerusalem. And what did they say? Did not our hearts burn within us as we talked, as he talked about, opened up the Old Testament? To their hearts to see that it was all about him we so often say the old testament is christ concealed and the new testament is christ revealed even though it's written over all these years there is a consistent message that is the three parts of the gospel that god is holy that man is a sinner and that a Savior is needed. All the parts and the theme of the whole testify that this is God's Word. And we know it's true. We know it's real. We have more copies of antiquarian manuscripts of the Bible than any other book. Dating back to within... Dozens of years of the original letters that were sent. There is no doubt that what we have today is what God breathed out. And we can trust it. Thirdly, our question tells us that the light and the power of Scripture change hearts. The light and power of the Scripture changes hearts. That it testifies to us at the very Word of God that it is authoritative in all that it teaches. The answer there says that the Spirit testifies in its application to us. I was listening to Steve Lawson this week as he was on a Q&A panel. And he said, look, if you love God, if God has truly changed your heart, you're going to love Him and obey Him and want to get to know Him better every day. He said, your old heart is taken away. He changes what you do and what you want to do. And that is the power of the Word of God and the application of that in your life by the Holy Spirit. And if you're not growing in Christ, if you're not in His Word, allowing the power of the Holy Spirit to make application to it, you need to ask yourself, do you truly love God? 2 Timothy 3, uh, 16 and 17, just a couple of uh, uh, pages uh, in your Bible to the, to the left reads this. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. What enables you to obey God? What enables you to do the work of His kingdom? It is God's Word that does that. The Bible is the light and to our path. It illuminates our hearts. Psalm 119 again, verse 105. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. It points us 
to where we should go and what we should do. It also illuminates, as we pray every week in our prayer of confession, it illuminates our hearts to where the sin resides. I know you've been in a room where you had to find something and it was perhaps dim or dark and it took turning the light on to be able to see what you were looking for. So it is with God's Word. He, he illuminates not only the path forward, but He illuminates the darkness that resides in our own hearts. Some people have, from time to time, accused me of being uh, too down and out. Too much talk about sin and the sin that resides in our hearts. And yet, it is the Word of God true. We must battle with it all the time. So not only is the Word of God majestic and pure, not only is the Word of God cohesive in all of its parts and as a whole, not only is it the light of our lives, but it is the Spirit alone that can proclaim it in your heart. Scripture tells us that the Bible is a stumbling block to those who do not have the Spirit of God in them. You run into these people, these people who will throw any argument in the world up against you that they can think of that you can't trust this old fuddy-duddy book that was written so many years ago that it has nothing to do with today's culture. And yet, how untrue that is. There is a timelessness of its truth and a timeliness of its message. The author equates the Word of God with the eyes of God as well. These verses can be haunting, can't they? Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Have you ever thought about that? That your thoughts, your words, your deeds, even in private, are not hidden from God? Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we will give an account. Jesus, the living, true Word of God. Now, when we say the Bible is living and active, we don't mean, you know, there's an argument with the Constitution, whether it's a, 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 a set-in-stone document or a, a quote-unquote living document that kind of ebbs and flows with culture. Well, we're not talking about that here. When we say God's Word is active and living, it means that it is alive in our hearts, that it does the work of the kingdom. It does not change with culture. It cannot come to mean something different today because today is not 2,000 years ago. It is dynamite for us all. Ravi Zacharias tells a great story of being in Lebanon um, with a great, great Christian missionary, uh, Sammy Dagger. And they're putting along and down, going down this road in uh, Sammy's old beat-up, I always envisioned it as being an old beat-up VW minibus, right? And they're going down the road in Lebanon, and they come to uh, a Lebanese checkpoint. And so the two of them are in the front seat, guard standing outside the driver's door, pointing his gun in. Ravi in the right-hand passenger seat, a guard standing there pointing his gun in. And the guy says to Sammy, do you have any explosives? Do you have any dynamite in your car? To which Sammy replies, yes, I do. And the guard's eyes get great big, and he kind of tightens down his grip on the rifle and takes a half step back. 
And Sammy reaches into the back seat and hands him a Bible. And he says, this is the most explosive thing you will ever see. That is what the Word of God is and should be for all of us. It is the light for our path and a lamp for our life. Let me close this morning with one thought. In Ephesians chapter 6, we have the armor of God. And all of that armor is defensive except for one piece. What piece is that? It's a sword, right? And then when we go a little further, which is the Word of God, Paul tells us, when we go a little further to Revelation, in the beginning of Revelation, when John is vouchsafed that glorious image of the Savior Himself, the one who stands mightily above all creation, protruding from the very mouth of God, of Christ Himself as He stands there, is a two-edged sword. The Word of God is an two-edged sword piercing the soul and the spirit the bone uh, the joint and marrow revealing all I'll close with these words from the prophet Isaiah as the rain and the snow comes down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So my word that goes out from my mouth will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I have sent it. God's promise that His word does matter and is effective, and does accomplish the purposes of His kingdom in you. Amen.